Look, today is the Detroit Policy Conference. The big focus, growing the city's population with an emphasis on making it an attractive place for talent and business development. Our Shana Humphreys is one-on-one -on -one right now with Mayor Mike Duggan, live at Motor City Casino Hotel. This is just getting started. Let's go ahead and listen in. Down is the greatest week ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot going on this week, this year, in the few months to come. So I want to talk about a lot of it. Let's start with the theme of the day, growing Michigan's population. How much of a priority is that in the city of Detroit? How much of a role will that play in the revitalization of Detroit? Well, it's, uh, it's huge. It's been my focus since I started. Uh, I think the Census Bureau is, is now recognized uh, they're counting issues, but I don't know if you saw the report in the last 24 hours, but uh, of 397 cities nationally, Detroit has now passed Miami as the greatest home price appreciation in America. Uh, who would have ever thought, right? Miami's led the country 16 months in a row. Detroit uh, past Miami. If you think about when I came in and we had 45,000 abandoned homes and everybody was moving out, uh, that we would ever be uh, cited for, for the growth. Uh, I've had issues with the Census Bureau. Right. Uh, we filed appeals and I think we're making progress, but when we finally got them, uh, they do an annual estimate every year. And, and for 21 and 22, they claimed that we lost population. I, I called the, and said, I just want to drive the Census Bureau director around the city. I mean, there's houses are being fixed up, apartments are being built everywhere. Explain this to me. So they gave us the underlying documents. And here's the way they do an annual estimate. It's net births, net deaths, or births and deaths, which we all agree on, and net migration. The way they calculate net migration is every time a housing unit is removed, they take a family out, and when a new housing building is started, they move a family in. Well, we knocked down 2,500 vacant houses. They counted that as they all had families with kids and dogs that all moved out of the city. Uh, I think they now recognize that they can't take down 6,000 people because we knocked down abandoned houses. And then the second thing is last year, we had more than 2,000 vacant houses people rehabbed and moved into. We don't have people building from scratch. They're fixing up the vacant houses. Well, the Census Bureau doesn't account for the possibility you could fix up vacant houses. They've never encountered this before, and so I'm really optimistic that two things are going to happen. One is there's no doubt population is growing in Detroit. But I'm very optimistic very shortly. The Census Bureau is going to officially declare okay. population is growing in, in Detroit. Uh, but, you know, the, and, and you know, I drove past here with the uh, site where they're building the new University of Michigan Graduate School uh, on, on right up the street on Grand River here. Uh, and, and that's a place where we're going to train folks for the jobs of the future. So a lot of pieces coming together. Right. I do want to touch on that in a few minutes. Uh, let's talk about when we're ensuring that people are staying in Detroit and attracting more people to Detroit. Safety is going to be a key part of that. You've got to be pleased with the 2023 crime numbers. Crime is down, particularly violent crime. Uh, well, I, I do believe we have the best uh, police chief in America uh, in James White. He's just doing an outstanding job. But we've had the cooperation of the prosecutor, the county executive who worked with the courts to clean up the backlog, the U.S. attorney, Don Eisen. For the first time in my lifetime, everybody is on the same page in attacking gun violence. And uh, when you're looking at 18% reductions in homicide, 33% reductions in carjackings, fewest homicides since 1966, that doesn't happen by coincidence. It happens because you have a very clear plan that said, here is why people are choosing to walk out of their homes in the morning armed with a gun. Every beef that you might have been a fist fight is turning into a, a shooting. We reversed that last year. And uh, uh, I'm really hopeful that we're going to reverse it and continue that decline uh, in 2024 as well. You mentioned clearing that backlog. What else do you attribute some of that success to? You know, uh, I, I, I meet with the command staff at the Detroit Police Department every two weeks. Uh, and uh, again, this is going to be boring to a lot of people, but uh, seven or eight years ago, I realized that our 33 top commanders, you have to have a college degree, 32 of them had a degree in criminal justice, and one had a degree in chemistry. I don't know how he got through. Um, but 
you're talking about running a 2,500 person organization with a $350 million budget. They don't have anybody trained in finance, anybody trained in HR, strategic planning and the like. And so I went down the street to Wayne State University. And I said, you know, in the hospital system where I worked, doctors went and got executive MBAs because you want to talk about people bad at managing, doctors are uh, about as bad as it comes. Uh, and so, so most hospital systems and med schools have these executive MBA programs. Wayne State put together a 30 credit hour program and we offered it to the commanders, the captains, the rising stars uh, and talked about this is how you deploy people. This is return on investment. If I'm going to give you $100,000 overtime for the second precinct uh, for the summer, how are you going to deploy it and what's the return going to be? Most of those individuals went on and got a full master's afterwards. Of course, we have a police chief who has a full master's. And you can go to the Detroit Police Department now and they're talking about the Starbucks business model. And so now we have a management team. Uh, that has their background in criminal justice, but who understand uh, what deployment means, how you put the cops in the areas that need it, how you commit your detectives uh, to the right kind of cases, how you target the chop shops instead of chasing around all the car thieves. Let's target the 100 chop shops in the cities that are in place to sell to. This is the kind of management uh, that you have at the Detroit Police Department. It's boring stuff, but it's a professional management team uh, running that department extremely well. Well, on the community side of things, you announced the Shot Stoppers program mm -hmm. last year. It's off and running now. What can you say about it? So this is an interesting uh, thing. And so w we've put $10 million towards six agencies. But this is the way I work. Uh, this, the shootings that were occurring during COVID, um, I just want to know what happened. And so I invited gang members in to see me. It's the damnedest thing. They wanted to be in the mayor's office. I offered to go to the neighborhood, but they'd never been in the mayor's office. Uh, and so I had a number of meetings. And when you talk to these young people about what's going on, it's amazing how they opened up. And there were some very powerful conversations. And I had uh, uh, people say to me, the first time, this is the first time I haven't carried a gun in two weeks because you had metal detectors downstairs. Uh, I had one guy had an arm in a sling for just been shot. And they said, if you go back a couple years, I wasn't carrying a gun. But when COVID happened and the court shut down, there are people in my neighborhood who have been arrested for shooting people. They don't have a trial schedule for two years. They're back on the street. I need to carry now too. Uh, and I really started to understand uh, what do we need to do? And so what I said to them was this. We're spending $350 million a year to uh, pay for the police department to get people to stop shooting each other. If I could pay somebody $10 million a year to get them to stop shooting each other, I'd do it. Now, that may sound kind of flip, but that's the way I view the world. Out of that came this partnership. And we have six organizations that are based in the community uh, that are deeply interactive in uh, gang activity. And uh, Todd Bettison, our deputy mayor, heads this up. But instead of saying, I'm going to give you a bunch of money and you don't go do good things, each of them has a three or four mile area that's their responsibility. And we measure the number of shootings that occurred in that four mile area a year ago and the number of shootings that have occurred now that you're responsible. They are in the schools talking to teenagers when a shooting occurs. They are at the hospital. They're talking to groups about not retaliating. They're, they're talking about job opportunities, uh, school opportunities. Uh, and we are seeing in November and December the early stages. But here's the interesting thing. We pay these nonprofits $175,000 a quarter. If they reduce the shooting rate faster than the rest of the city, they get another $175,000 as a bonus. So the most effective community organizations will get more money they have to put into further prevention. And so at the end of January, we're going to see, but I think we're going to have a couple of these groups uh, get a bonus for being successful. And the other groups who aren't making it are saying, what are you doing? Uh, and so we're doing two things. We're running a first class law enforcement police department, but we're also taking the people who are trusted uh, most by the community, and we're paying them to intervene and, and prevent. And so you're going to have hard data, whether this works or not. The White House, I'm going to be there uh, next week. But they're fascinated because this is not the way prevention money has been spent nationally, that you give an, somebody a, a four square mile area and say, 
the numbers are your responsibility. Yeah, the, the numbers, the statistics being down, of course, different than people feeling safer and noticing the difference. What are you hearing from people? Oh, What's the reaction? There's no question. We've heard it all over the city. Uh, less gunfire at night, uh, feel safer. Uh, there's no question uh, that people in this city uh, have seen the difference uh, in the shootings. Uh, and, you know, we do so many things. This, we have something called Shot Spotter, the most violent areas of the city. They have got this amazingly sophisticated sound detection system when gunshots go off. And it's unfortunate. There's areas of the city, people are gunfire, they don't bother to call the police. Uh, now, the Shot Spotter alert tells the precinct, precincts there immediately, we found people who are laying on the ground with a gunshot wound who nobody had called the police. That the fact that the shot spotter was there allowed a response. But what we're doing is we are picking up shell casings from every single site. Most of the time when the cops get there, everybody's gone, right? Okay, we got away with it. We're picking up the shell casings. We're putting them through a ballistic system through the, uh, uh, the uh, ATF. Uh, and we've solved a lot of cases by getting the casings on the site. So two groups are engaged in a beef. We know this gun was used before in this shooting. Now it's used over here, even though maybe there wasn't a victim. Uh, we're tying cases together. It's uh, uh, to see all the things that are happening uh, is exciting. Yeah, let's talk about some of the other things happening. A lot of projects underway, some just broke ground, some getting ready to start. A lot of them do focus on the riverfront, the downtown area, and sometimes there can be some criticism for that. You know, what about the rest of the city? How do you think some of this development has downstream effects around Detroit? Yeah, the people who are talking about that don't live in the city. Uh, if you look at what's happening now uh, on Livernoy between seven and eight mile, you can't uh, find a vacant storefront. You can't find a place to park on Saturdays when the avenue of fashions come back. You look at what's happening on, on McNichols between Wyoming and Livernoy, all those vacant storefronts uh, being transformed. You look at Kerchival near Van Dyke, which uh, there was nothing there 10 years ago. Apartments and shops and the like. Uh, now uh, we're starting to transform Dexter Avenue and Rosa Parks in neighborhoods people thought we'd uh, never get to. And what's exciting is uh, that we're redoing the streetscapes, uh, you got stores starting to open. Now you're getting long, vacant apartments that people are, are fixing up. And I just uh, came from two hours ago, a ribbon cutting uh, on Michigan Avenue, uh, the new apartment building, the perennial, down the street from the train station. 200 new apartments uh, built on Michigan Avenue across the old Tiger Stadium. Remember when Tiger Stadium closed in the early 2000s? Everybody said, Corktown's dead without Tiger Stadium. Uh, come check out Corktown now. Uh, and the thing I love about it is 10% of the units are for very low income, $855 a month. So people of all incomes are able to live in all neighborhoods because we make this a condition of when you build new housing that you set aside units for people of lower income. Uh, and that's the way a city should be, people of all incomes in every neighborhood. A lot of apartments going up, a lot of hotels. Yeah. Tell me about the hotel at Water Square. Yeah. Why is this such a big deal? Um, so. Uh, if Claude Molinari were here, he, he's uh, an evangelist on this, he runs uh, Visit Detroit. Uh, but there are, I'm going to say in a given year, 120 conventions that are citywide conventions. Uh, and we've been winning eight or ten a year. But there are a large number that won't even let you apply if you don't have a convention hotel attached to the convention center. Uh, and so. Uh, we have been missing out on literally uh, tens of millions of dollars of investment. And what Claude points out is Cleveland has got uh, a, an attached convention hotel. Indianapolis, he says Toledo has an attached convention hotel. Grand Rapids has an attached convention hotel. Uh, and it is time Detroit joins that. And so uh, we're really pleased that the Sterling Group has partnered uh, with the convention center. Uh, and I, I hope it will get approved uh, by City Council this spring. Uh, and Detroit uh, will be able to participate in far more meetings and uh, uh, in conventions when we get that uh, hotel built. So it would be attached by a skywalk. Right. And then Second Avenue is expanded. Right. So if you're not from down here, this probably won't mean a lot to you, but if you happen to live in the Fort Shelby apartments at, at basically Lafayette, uh, and First Street, you can't get to the riverfront today. If you try to go down Cass, you dead end into the convention center. First, second, third, it dead ends. And you can't get to the riverfront. 
What we're going to do on Second Avenue behind the convention center would be the west side is that street's going to be opened up with a tree line plaza all the way down to the riverfront and next to that the ralph wilson park is going to open later this year which will be an absolutely spectacular park so now people who live in downtown apartments will be able to walk a few blocks enjoy the riverfront or jog or bike or whatever they they do. So you're doing two things at once. You're having a convention hotel right next to where you see that new apartment building got built there, but you're also tying the west side of downtown to the riverfront like it's never been tied to before. And downtown is a neighborhood now. You know, the downtown that I worked in, uh, you drove in at 8.30 in the morning and you left at 5 o'clock at night and by 5.30 the streets were empty. Uh, downtown is now a neighborhood. People living there, we have more activity on, on nights and weekends sometimes than, than weekdays, and that's what a real city has. Downtown's a neighborhood. Tell me about the University of Michigan Center for Innovation. This is not just a Detroit campus for the university, correct? Uh, it is. Uh, it may end up being the most important thing uh, that I've done. Uh, and, and I talked to President Santa Ono his first week of the job. I gave him a tour of the city, put him in my car, I drove around, I showed him where the first University of Michigan was in 1817, talked about the mistake they made moving out in 1837, uh, and said, you have a chance to fix that. Uh, and, and here's what triggered it. We were enormously fortunate that Stephen Ross, uh, who you know, is probably the largest developer uh, in the country, says, the high-end corporations, the jobs of the future, they want to know the top talent is being trained nearby. Uh, and Bill Ford had this vision that he was going to compete with Silicon Valley on the electric and autonomous vehicles of the year by creating a whole new center where his engineers would design these vehicles. He said, we're not going to compete uh, with the Googles and the Apples and the like uh, on a structure where our executive vice presidents are on the 10th floor and the senior vice presidents are on the 9th floor. And he said, I either got to go to Silicon Valley or I got to go to Ann Arbor and create this. And I said, Bill, the kids may want to graduate from the University of Michigan, but they want to live in Detroit where they're done. Bill Ford was the guy who found the train station and called me up and he says, I got the perfect location. Uh, and now all the talent in Ford wants to, to be there. But had, at the time, we had the University of Michigan grad school there, it would have been a no-brainer of a decision. We're going to have the top grad school uh, students trained in mobility, in engineering, in software technology, in climate change technology. Uh, they are going to come to the graduate school at the University of Michigan in Detroit, and they're going to be tied into these companies, which means the companies of the future are looking for their headquarters are now going to look at Detroit. So let's come full circle to your population change idea. Where do young people want to be? They want to be where the jobs of the future are. And I think with what the University of Michigan is building, Detroit's going to be set up for the next 20 years to be able to track those companies. And there's also a community aspect to that, right? Other kinds oh. of job training, right? Oh, no doubt. And so you, you are sitting where we are building it in the shadow of Cass Tech High School. Uh, and all kinds of, yeah, we got some technicians here, I hear, right? Uh, so, so you're going to have programs uh, right now that will come right out of the gate where, where the high school students can have uh, classes and activities. We're going to run summer camps for 10 and 12 year olds at the University of Michigan campus. We want children growing up uh, to be exposed at an early point, and they're already starting uh, to prepare, for example, cybersecurity courses for people to get uh, the kind of training that you might be hired for a bank right away, even short of the grad school. That's what uh, Santa Ono's vision is, what Stephen Ross's uh, vision is, and as far as I'm concerned, they can't build it fast enough. So from world-class academic facility to a medical facility, let's talk about the Henry Ford expansion. Yeah. Uh, still the case that they're not asking for any incentives for the hospital portion. Uh, so life is an interesting thing. Uh, for nine years, I ran the Detroit Medical Center, uh, and I competed with Henry Ford uh, really uh, tenaciously. In fact, when I decided to run for mayor, they were the first ones to donate to my campaign to make sure I was gone from DMC. Uh, and, uh, but Bob Riney, their CEO, just does an outstanding job. And a lot of the hospital systems over the years bailed on the city of Detroit, moved their hospitals to the suburbs. A DMC and Henry Ford stayed. Uh, and 
what Henry Ford is doing now is talking about a $2 billion commitment, building the finest hospital in the Midwest, uh, right here uh, in the city of Detroit. Uh, that's going to be a great thing. But then what happens? You've seen it happen in Brooklyn. You've seen it happen in Washington, D.C. You get redevelopment. You get gentrification. People who have lived in the neighborhood get pushed out when rents go up. They said, we don't want that to happen. And so they partner with Tom Gorris and the Pistons and say, let's build housing units with 20% of the units being set aside for affordable housing so that we're going to build more affordable housing in the neighborhood than exists today. So the people who work in the cafeteria or push the wheelchairs in the hospital can live in the same neighborhood as the doctors and the nurses. Uh, it's a whole plan uh, coming together. I was pleased that the neighborhood group, the neighborhood advisory committee, overwhelmingly approved it. The Brownfield Authority approved it yesterday, and it's on its way uh, to city council now. And uh, it is pretty, uh, pretty special uh, to have Henry Ford that could build anywhere uh, put a $2 billion facility in the city of Detroit. Is the idea for it to have sort of a Mayo Clinic effect, a destination medical center? Well, Henry Ford operates on the staff model like Mayo Clinic. They're now partnering with Michigan State that's going to have a research center and I think uh, is very likely going to open a medical school campus uh, there. So Michigan State's been, been looking for the right location. Henry Ford for years has been looking for the medical school partner. Uh, and so you're talking about not just building a new hospital, but having a medical school partner, a research center, uh, all in one place. And Grand Boulevard, you look at what's happening now, the Motown Museum uh, has come back uh, dramatically. The housing is filling in, and pretty soon that tall vacant building that you can see from the lodge, Lee Plaza, Work's going to start on that to be renovated, and the housing's going to fill in there. Uh, and so all of Grand Boulevard uh, is, is just going to explode. Let's talk about the solar initiative. Uh, the six finalists will right. be announced pretty soon. Right. So I just got tired of politicians in this country giving speeches about climate change and getting all kinds of followers on social media, not actually doing anything about it. It's amazing how much attention you can get for talking eloquently about climate change without doing anything. Uh, so I thought, what if we try just the opposite? Uh, so uh, I wanted to take all of the city buildings uh, and put them on solar power, move them from DTE to renewable energy, police stations, rec centers, city hall, firehouses, everything. Chicago did this, but they're building a solar field four hours away. Cincinnati did this. They built a solar field out in the farms an hour away. But what if Detroit could be the city where we say we're serious about climate change? This flooding we've seen in this city, there is no doubt where it is coming from. These storms are getting much more heavy. Last summer, you had trouble breathing from the, can the smoke from the Canadian wildfires. This is real. We have a responsibility to deal with it. And so I said to the community, there are neighborhoods in this city where there's one occupied house per block, one occupied house for every two blocks. And I ran in 2013 and said, every neighborhood has a future. I actually believe that. And so I said to the neighbors who think they've been forgotten, you propose the area where we clean out everything that's there and we put in solar fields. And we have a lot of places where you might have a 10 block area that is uh, largely abandoned, but not too far away, you've got a pretty solid neighborhood. What if we made solar panels in the 10 blocks that were largely deserted? And what if we took the benefits of that and put $15,000 a house into all the remaining neighbors for you to upgrade your own energy efficiency, new windows, new furnaces, new central air, fix the roof and the like? And so nine neighborhoods have proposed. I only need six, so we're going to pick six finalists. Uh, and I'm excited about it. The neighborhoods are excited. Right now, the neighborhoods have until January 31st to show me. I want to know how many of the neighbors have signed up. Uh, and we are closing in on the point where nearly every person who's an owner-occupied house that's going to be taken have agreed to a purchase price. So the, the owner-occupied folks in the zone, most of them are very happy to have the check and be able to move. They have to show me that the neighbors want it in the neighborhood. So they're all out knocking on doors and gathering signatures. And the six neighborhoods that gather the most signatures show the most support. 
Uh, we're going to forward on to council. I'm hoping we're building solar fields uh, by the end of the year in the neighborhoods that want them. Yeah, we know that climate change effects disproportionately affect communities of color. Is this a step towards addressing that? Indeed? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, in, in um, uh, 20, I think it was 2015, uh, we had this flooding and we had a once in 100 year storm. And then in 2021, we had a once in 500 year storm. Uh, and, and our sewer system was built for the climate of the 20th century. Uh, not the 21st century. And so we're doing a lot of things to try to deal with that capacity. But, but my thing is, how do I know in two years we're not going to get a once in a thousand year storm? Uh, everybody has a responsibility uh, to deal with uh, the warming of the planet. And Detroit's going to step up and say, you think we're some troubled city that doesn't care. I want to show the rest of the country uh, that we can move our city buildings uh, to 100% renewable power. Uh, right within the city, and I hope we end up being a model for, uh, for other cities in the country. As we're short on time, we have to touch on the draft. Coming up late April, this is actually bigger than the Super Bowl. It, it, it is. I, I, I've been to the NFL draft two years ago in Las Vegas and uh, last year um, in uh, Kansas City, and football fans are nuts. Uh, the people... 300,000 people show up, they're convinced that this year's first round draft choice is going to change the fortunes of their franchise. Uh, it was really odd to be at last year's draft and not have the Lions have the first or second pick. Uh, it was a, a good feeling. We're finally out of that conversation. Uh, and people pour in and they're in such good spirits. In Las Vegas and in Kansas City, they did it in huge parks away from their downtowns. In those cities... Uh, if you were downtown, you would have not have known the NFL draft was in town. And it's an easy way to do it. And so we sat down and said, what are we going to do in Detroit? We could have done it on Belle Isle, which would have been the equivalent of what they did, and had it self-contained logistically. We said, we're not going to do that. We want this draft to be for the community. We want to benefit all of the restaurants and the shops, the hotels that are downtown. And so it's going to be an enormous logistical challenge. Uh, but we are going to do it on a site that goes from Campus Marshes to Hart Plaza. Uh, and you're going to see people go to the draft, go out to a local restaurant, a local shop, walk down along the riverfront. Um, and, of course, it's the last week in April. So assuming the weather cooperates, uh, this is going to be a spectacular three days for the city of Detroit. So that's three days in April, but there are events starting this weekend leading up to them. What's the significance in drumming up the excitement around the city before then? Um, so we're different in Detroit. I mean, we're doing draft events at rec centers. Uh, we're going to have events for children uh, in parks uh, with, with different activities. Uh, we've got a, a number of Detroit area um, vendors who have already got contracts to be setting up downtown to make Detroit companies benefit uh, from the, the draft being here. And so this isn't going to be something where we accommodate a bunch of people out of town for three days and they leave and nobody's benefited. This is going to be uh, a Detroit community event. What do you think the potential is for this to really influence the perception of Detroit around the country and world? Well, I just said to you, I mean, think about the last time you had friends in from out of town who hadn't been here and you bring them down to Detroit. What do they say, right? Oh, my God, I never knew this was Detroit. Take them down to the riverfront. I said, I never knew you had a riverfront. I never knew you had all this construction. We have a national image fueled by the images 10 years ago of bankruptcy and when we had the highest homicide rate, highest unemployment rate, highest poverty rate in the country. Those are the images that are fixed in the minds of people nationally. The only way to undo this is not some story in the Los Angeles Times, but get people here to see it. You bring 300,000 people from around the country and they get to see Detroit for those three days, they're going to be thinking, maybe my business could go here. Uh, maybe my son ought to look here uh, for school. Uh, i got to bring my family back and come visit and see a Tiger game uh, uh, this summer and come spend a weekend. It is our chance to uh, once and for all do away with this image America had from the bankruptcy 10 years ago. And that's a lot of responsibility on Claude, the Visit Detroit team and the Detroit Lions, but I think they're up to it. Not bad that this is happening when the Lions are on a tear. <laughs> well, all i got to say is, uh, last year we went to the draft in Kansas City. They said it was because Kansas City won the Super Bowl. Um, so I'm hoping history repeats itself. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. All right. <laughs> Thank you.